when he starts using the word cultivate and leading us in worship, that's one of my favorite words. After all, isn't that what we're trying to do is cultivate a life for God? That, I mean, that's, that's what we're after. I couldn't help but think when Kurt was explaining Cornerstone to some of, some of our seniors that they didn't remember the Cornerstone that went down on their home some years ago. I, I don't want to date you guys, but, uh, but there was a day when, when you actually built your foundation that's not too far away, you know, too far back, but uh, those that did that really get that cornerstone analogy. It, it's a fantastic analogy. That is an incredible song that we sing. You know, we're going to, we're going to move further in the, the ninth chapter of Luke this morning. Um, you know, I, I, I was thinking so much this week. I remember last year, and, and, I'm, and I'm looking out this morning. We had such a big crowd last week. And then we're so small today, and I knew I knew with the rain and the cold it would be that way. But uh, I want I just want to encourage you because I, I think the way I explained it last year, and some of you younger when younger folks here are going to go, "Wow, he's that old," and some of you older folks will say he's just a baby. But I remember when I turned fifty. Uh, now I'm fifty-one. It really began to dawn on me. Uh, that uh, I was getting older, and I just began to even yearn more for a closeness with Jesus. Not more church or more religion or more any of that stuff. A closer relationship with my Lord and all that that meant. And I've worked hard in my own life, and I, I just want to say... I want that for everyone. I want that to be what we're about, is this cultivating or just, you know, we, we mess up so much in our worldly relationships, don't we, a lot, friendships and just all the different relationships we have. But this is a perfect one and the one we have with Jesus. And I just want it to be so much better for me and for you and that's what I hope is to help each and every one of us to have a better relationship with Jesus. The drawback to that is that he wants us to have a better relationship with each other and to love each other and to experience him through each other. So part of that cultivating that relationship with Jesus is also cultivating the relationships we have with each other in our community. And that has nothing to do with my sermon. I just wanted to say that to you this morning because it's a yearning I have that when I look out from here, when you look at the, I just long to see these blue chairs filled with people who have a yearning for a relationship with each other and with Jesus. Because it's one and the same if we're followers. It's, it, it, it's all tied up into what Jesus wants. Because we are going to be together for eternity. All of us. In, in everything we do, we will be together. And so I think helping to get to that point in our, in our lives now will help us be better followers of Christ now and in eternity, which kind of is a prelude to what I want to talk about now. I mean, we've got all day, right? There's nothing else going on today. It's cold. Uh, it's wet. We might as well stay here a couple of hours. Let's look at John chapter 9. Uh, we're going to be verse 18 through 22. Okay, so last week he fed the 5,000, right? And remember that? He fed the 5,000. And now, I like the way this works, he fed the 5,000, taught, taught the disciples, and now it happened that he was praying alone. The disciples were with him, and he asked them, who had they just been with? 5,000 men and their families, right? Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others, the one, one of the prophets 
of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he charged them and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So we've been in the Gospel of Luke for some time and we'll continue there as we get to the book of Acts. But this is a, uh, a major turning point here in the Gospel of Luke. As Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. And so we know... Hopefully from the past, Christ, the Greek word, Messiah. Literally, he's saying the Messiah. And so, and it opens the door, in, and we'll start there next week in verse 23, for an all-out discussion of what discipleship, of what following Jesus is going to look like. So, we see that the recognition here of Jesus as Christ, as the Messiah, is essential. It's, it, 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 it's part of responding to Jesus. But also that it, it must be accompanied by an explanation of, of his messianic activity. It's his, it's his role as the Messiah. So Jesus, yes, is going to return to this earth one day. And he'll come in glory this time. He won't come as a baby in a manger he will come in glory, and he will, what, um, his, his authority will be visible, he will judge the, the, the unrighteousness, and he will vindicate all of those who have followed him. So, before his glory comes, though, he, he says here, there will be what? There will be suffering. So, before his glory comes, suffering, and he says that his disciples are going to, his followers are going to walk the same road. And so, after Peter's confession, Jesus has to teach them more, the disciples, the follower more. Jesus has more to teach them about the Messiah. So, verse 35, later, we're not there yet, we'll get there next week, but it says, they must listen. Followers of Jesus must listen to him to understand God's plan. And so, for followers of Jesus to be affected, then they, something has to change. And it's their view of the world. The, how they view things has to change. You know, their personal instincts, how they think it should be, is no longer going to be enough. They won't be able to make it on this road of suffering if they just trust their worldly view, their worldly instincts. Something has to change if they're going to get through this suffering and be able to serve. So... What has been going on in Luke? What have we been studying? Luke has been trying to help us to understand who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus? We studied it in chapter 4. We studied it in chapter 6. We studied it in chapter 8. And just two weeks ago, we looked at it in chapter 9, where Herod's own palace was asking, who, who is this Jesus? And now, finally, it's been two years that they've been walking with him. Now, finally... The, the disciples, uh, they produce a, 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 an answer to who Jesus is, and Jesus responds in, in a very positive way to this. So Peter knows now, Jesus isn't just a prophet. Jesus isn't just one of many that have come to tell about God. Uh, he's not just one who will, will, will mediate God's word to us, so to speak. He is the promised deliverer of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. The Greek word there is Christ. So, the confession, it occurs gradually here. Uh, Jesus first, he, he asked about the popular understanding among the people. Who, who do they say that I am? And the answer matches what we saw in verses 7 through 9 when, they, when Herod's palace was, was asking who he was. So it matches exactly what was going on there. And that's why Luke reached forward and brought that back. Actually, we haven't come to the spot in Luke where 
John's been beheaded, but he brought that story back because he's trying to help us understand. He's trying to help the people he wrote to understand who Jesus is. So who does the crowd think he is? Same thing. A prophet? They think he's a prophet? Who, who's the crowd? It's these 5,000 people that he just performed this miracle, this unbelievable miracle part where we had more bread and fish than anybody could eat. So again, he's a prophet. Uh, reappearance of John the Baptist. So in contrast, Peter says, but he's the Messiah. No, he's the Messiah. And so the, uh, the importance of this can't be missed. We must not miss this. He sees Jesus as God's promised ruler. You know, Though this category is, 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 is short of a full confession of him being God, that'll come. That'll come, his confession of him as God. It's short of that, but it's beyond anything that the disciples have confessed before. And so more time with Jesus, more reflection on, on the significance of his resurrection that's going to come later will produce that deeper understanding of Jesus, Jesus being God. So... One thing that, that we can see here, though, is that, that Peter's confession can lead to what is ahead for followers of Jesus. And so Jesus immediately move, moves here to correct that possibility. Uh, you know, the disciples, as, as later followers were going to do in Jesus' ministry, they anticipate this direct road to glory. Let's go to Jerusalem and take it. Okay? You're the Messiah. And so they believe power and the power and the and the privilege that's that's associated with him that it that it's gonna come without any they, they don't see the suffering, they don't see the, the death, and so he corrects them. They have a lot to learn about the road that the Messiah is gonna travel. So what does he say? He predicts the suffering of the Son of Man in rejection, in death, in resurrection. That's in verses uh, 21 and, and 22. So these things must happen. He's, he's saying these things must happen. And Luke indicates, and Luke is showing us, this is God's design. This is anything the world's going to come up with. This is God's design that the Messiah, the one to come that represents him, is being called to suffer. And then maybe just as a note, uh, this, is, this is the first son of man saying in Luke. This is the first time that he notes that the son of man uh, is going to suffer. And so, and let me just point out. And those of you who have a, a pen or, or take notes, let me just point out the Old Testament background. The Old Testament uh, speaks to the necessity of this suffering. And there's a clear combination of teachings. You may be familiar with them. They're actually where we go to get uh, verses that allude to this suffering. But there's the imagery of the suffering servant. And this is a beautiful passage in Isaiah. It's Isaiah 52, 13. Through 53 12. It's just before uh, Isaiah uh, talks about the internal, the eternal covenant that we are going to have with God. And then there's the idea of the suffering of the righteous that we get throughout the uh, uh, New Testament. And there's five Psalms that speak to this there's Psalm 16, 22, 31. 69 and 118. So 16, 22, 31, 69, and 118. This would be great reading for you during the week. This is the, this is the, the background for this theme of, of suffering. So the, what, what the Old Testament teaches us is that suffering precedes the glory. And so, you know, it's this very surprising route to glory that that, that, that caused Jesus, as we read, in ver and, and it's kind of surprising in verse 21, but it's this, all of a sudden, this idea that the Messiah is going to suffer in his route to glory that causes him to call for silence. And, and, and especially these early uh, uh, recognitions 
by the disciples that him is the Messiah. Because the Messiah is seen by the people as this triumphant figure who is not going to suffer at all. So the disciples must have God's true plan explained to them before they can share it with others. So, despite their need for further instruction, though, Peter's confession is an amazing turning point in this gospel. You know, in recognizing Jesus as the promised one, Peter and the other disciples are seeing that Jesus is unique. So, this is an, a, an, a, an essential, a critical building block to helping us understand God's plan of redemption and that it will be accomplished through Jesus. You know, where, as we've seen and, and was familiar to the people in the Old Testament and even up to now, where a, a, a prophet that was, was a category that came up short in describing who Jesus was, Messiah is one that places him as the promised deliverer of God. So that's why if you, if you look up this uh, scripture or the, the parallel version of this scripture over in Matthew, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus actually says that he notes that on this rock, uh, that is on the confession that Peter gave, on, on the confession of people like Peter who see this, on this rock, the church will be built. The rock is this confession that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. So to be a Christian is to understand this unique role of Jesus. You see, to be a Christian is to understand what Peter's saying here, this incredible role of Jesus. There is absolutely no one else with this role. Never has been, never will be. There is no one with the unique role of Jesus. There is no one else like him in the plan of God. He is the only foundation, the cornerstone. He is the only foundation that this house can be built on. Paul, Paul told this to the, the uh, Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where we get the cornerstone passage. I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. So how do, we, how do we bridge that? How do we bring that to 2015? Got to get used to saying that, but I've done pretty good. How do we bring that to 2015? Well, there's a significance here to help us bridge it. The significance of this prediction has implications now, hear all of these words. It has direct implications for the way believers are to receive his blessing. Now, a lot of people want to talk about that. I should have just named the sermon that and put it out there. How to receive Jesus' blessing. This, this passage speaks directly to how we're to live a life and receive God's blessing. Jesus says there is a path that my disciples, that my followers are expected to follow. And this path may lead to suffering. And, you know, though, though this path may be different in the 21st century, they, they knew exactly what he was talking about then. Death. You know, being excluded from one's family. Uh, all of those sort of things that, yes, even some in our world feel today if they're believers. They knew the consequences. And in some cultures, they still have these consequences for following Jesus. But in places like the United States, where there's religious tolerance, so to speak, I just, just don't even like those words, <laughs> religious tolerance, but in places like the United States, where there's tolerance, this suffering may be a little more subtle. You know, believers uh, may not be understood you know, when they maybe take a, they value their family over a promotion at work or something. Or maybe when they decide, hey, we're going to take the kids and we're going to travel to a foreign country to share the gospel. You know, things like that, uh, people may not understand here in the United States. You know, 
Even immediate family doesn't understand sometimes the decisions we make to, to serve God. But hear me. Followers are called, and, and if you're writing down, you might write that down. Followers are called to reflect very distinct values in the choices they make in life. Jesus is, is, is saying here, there will be distinct choices that you have to make in order to be a follower of mine. So how does that have to do with the way one receives his blessing? Well, when we choose the way of our Lord, we receive his blessing. When we choose the way of the world, we won't. I think it's that, that, that clear. When we choose the way of the Lord, we receive his blessing. When we choose the way of the world, we do not. And it's not a matter of what one desires, what one needs, what one wants, what one hopes, what one wants to have. His way is the only way that is going to be blessed. So, you know, I know we. this is a value that we've taught our children for a couple of decades now. That individual choice is the most important thing. The choices you make are the most important thing. Well, maybe on life's scoreboard, so to speak, it is here in this world, but in Jesus's and, and for, for, the, for, for a follower of Jesus, it, it doesn't. So that, what if a woman becomes pregnant? Or we get married. Or we become parents. There's only one way. And it's Jesus' way. You know, it's very, very popular to say... In regard to unborn children, the most important thing is the woman's choice, right? The Bible says, no, the most important thing is the life. That's Jesus' way. So when it comes to marriage, the world says the most important thing is that each person be happy and fulfilled and their needs met. No, no. Jesus has a different, a different way for followers of him to be married when it comes to raising children. The world says certain things about raising our children, and there's a worldly way to do it. Jesus says, no. There's a way the Bible says to raise our children. And even for those children, the world says, there's a way to be a child in this world. And the Bible says, no, there's a way to be a child of Christian parents in this world. Everything we need to know about this life, Jesus explained to us. There's, there's, or God has explained to us there's ways that followers live out their life. And so, you know, it, 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 the, the tough choices in this world... They may lead to our being misunderstood. And they may lead to our suffering. Well, let me change that. Let me just say they will. The choices we make in life, in regard to all of the, the, the ways we live in our life, they're going to be misunderstood. And they're going to lead to suffering. The suffering, you know, may not be the kind of physical persecution that Jesus felt or the physical persecution that the disciples ultimately felt. But there is a form of rejection that's going to come about when we choose to follow Jesus and live a life that's described in his word. So, though dying for our faith is highly unlikely in the nation we live in, at least for a few more years, uh, suffering is still a reality for those who seek to engage the world with their commitment to Jesus. It simply is. So there's the bridge. Things have changed. But then again, maybe they haven't. You know, as we apply this to our lives today, 
to 2015 seeking to say, Pastor, what does that look like in my life today? Well, this essential, this foundational cornerstone significance in this text is the recognition about who Christ is, who Jesus is. That's the most important thing for every one of us here this morning to answer. Who is Jesus? As I look at everyone I interact with in my life, whether it's family or friends or people in the marketplace, wherever it is, and as I study more and more those in our community today, there is no greater tragedy in this life than this era of judgment and that the world is underestimating who Jesus is. There's no greater error in this life than to underestimate who Jesus is. You know, to miss out on the one who possesses life is literally to miss out on life itself. And to understand him as, as the Messiah, as the Christ, is what we have to do. To understand him as anything less than Christ and the Messiah is, is really to, to come up short. You know, I, I'm, I don't have enough time to go into some of the analogies that are popping to my head right now, but, you know, let me just say, because I think this is one that maybe everyone might understand. Paul uses it, the runner, the runner, people who run. And let's just call it a marathon. Because I think a marathon fits life more than like a 100-yard dash or a mile or five miles. A marathon, 26 miles, I think. Somebody, uh, if I'm wrong, let's just be wrong. 26 miles. So imagine doing that for the Olympics, which is usually, you know, celebrates the greatest athletes of the previous four years. Come together. So imagine you're the best, one of the best in the world, and you're running the marathon. And they got you on TV with the camera and the helicopters, and, the, and you're running. But you misunderstood the rules, and you ran 25.9999 miles and stopped. And you got there first and stopped right in front of the finish line. Imagine that. Most of you are thinking that would be pretty stupid, right? Well, everyone who doesn't come to the point where they realize Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Messiah, is like a runner who ran 25.99 miles in the Olympics, in the marathon, and stopped. That would be pretty stupid. With all the evidence... I'm going to get in trouble for using the word stupid. My wife will tell me later. Don't use that word. Ignorant is actually in the Bible, but it's harder to say. So that would be pretty ignorant of us to do that. You know, I just don't want that for anyone. I don't want to be the one who didn't help someone move that last step towards Jesus. And that's who we need to be at Ridgecrest is People who help people take that last step towards realizing that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Messiah. You know, that's why later in Luke 20 that, that Jesus is going to ask why David called the Messiah Lord rather than the Son. You know, there is an order in the plan of God. There's a strict order. And Jesus is right here at the top. He's that cornerstone. This has come up. Through the, I'm really glad we sang that. He is. He's the keystone. He's the peace that we have to have in that place. You pull him out, everything's going to fall apart. And so, you know, I had a lot more I wanted to say, but, but let me just, just be clear. It's not it's not just about making Jesus important in our lives or 
saying that he's very influential in our lives. Or knowing all the major points of theology, doctrine. It's really just simply about choosing to, to come to a place where we lay it all down before him, acknowledge him as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the Son of God, give up our life, and follow him. And so that's my charge today. There's no greater tragedy in this world than to underestimate Jesus Christ. And there's no way to follow Jesus but in a life that demonstrates his values. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this place and these words of Peter. Who, whose name means rock. But Father, we know when, when Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, it was that confession. It had nothing to do with the man. It was what came out of his lips. And we know that only the Holy Spirit could have given him that information. And today it's the same. Only your Holy Spirit can move in a place, in a heart, in a family, and so, Father, that's what I pray. That not just people, but this community, that you would move in this community and move people towards that understanding that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. In him, the kingdom has come. He is our cornerstone. He is our capstone. He is everything to us. If this place should fall to the ground tomorrow, if one of these earthquakes should knock down everything in Dallas, we know we have a hope that can surpass all knowledge that the kingdom is built on this confession that Jesus is the Christ. In your precious name, amen. Amen.